Okay, hello. I am very happy to greet you. Many of you are uh, new faces for me, so I am happy to see you first time in transit. I am uh, Judith Angel, I am a curator, and uh, I am also director of this art space, Transit Eshka. And uh, today's lecture is uh, the second in the series of lectures we co-initiated with my uh, colleagues, Alessandra Pomarico, Borba Lasos, Ovidiu Tikindeleanu, with whom we curated the exhibition Grounding Seeding, which was here in transit from April until July. And uh, this was uh, basing the new program of transit, which among other focuses on the colonial dome. And the first uh, lecture in the series was Aldo Ramos in July. And now, uh, today, we have our guest, Françoise Vergel. And uh, she is a political uh, theorist, feminist, independent curator, uh, public educator, and uh, decolonial activist who is currently living in Paris. Between 2020 and 22, she published two books. Uh, one of them is uh, The Colonial Feminist, which we have here in our library. And um, the other book is um, um, Theory of Violence, uh, the colonial from the Colonial Perspective. And uh, she also directed movies on uh, Caribbean authors, Aimé Césaire and uh, Marie Condé. And uh, she worked with uh, black uh, or artists of color, sorry. And uh, she is also a co-founder of the non-profit Decolonize the Art and its Open University. And uh, today, um, the moderators of the discussion are following the lecture are um, our guest, um, Lubisa Kobova, who uh, is um, uh, the teaching at the... Um, uh, Department of Gender Studies of Faculty of Humanities at Charles University in Prague. And uh, also we have uh, Susanna Magyarova, who is a researcher at the Faculty of uh, 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 Social and Economic Sciences at Comenius University in Bratislava. And both of them uh, collaborate with the feminist uh, educational and uh, publishing organization aspect based in Bratislava. And uh, now I am passing the floor to Francois. So um, please feel you yourself very welcome. And uh, you are welcome to start your lecture. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to be standing so everyone can see me and also I can see you, otherwise I'm, I'm not that tall so I won't see anyone. And um, do, uh, is everyone hearing me in the back also? It's fine? Or should I speak louder? It's okay? It's okay? Thank you. Okay, so the, um, I'm going to address my talk in three parts. You know, that all of them, they address the topic and they are interrelated, but nonetheless, I thought that in three uh, parts will be easier for you than, you know, if I blah, blah for 40 minutes altogether. So I will first uh, uh, talk about the idea of Europe, you know, so why, what is decolonial Europe, what would be decolonial Europe. Then the question of representation that is, you know, such a big debate today in museum, gallery, in the world of art and in the world of politics. And finally, what is decolonial feminism, uh, you know, that as a, as a method, a practice, and a theory. So in which way it's, uh, you know, connect with that. So first, the idea of Europe, because we are talking about Europe as if it's a, like natural creation, something that, you know, emerged practically naturally from, from the earth. And I've been always interested in its story, its cartography, and its deep, deep connection with uh, race, racism, and colonial history. So nothing is natural about, you know, uh, Europe and, and uh, nothing. Of course, speaking about Europe today, when Europe represents the refuge and the sanctuary for so many people, especially, if, of course, from Ukraine, but also from Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, Iraq, uh, and other countries, from Senegal and Mali, could be, you know, uh, could be problematic. But my, my question is, like, why Europe became this, continent of human rights and humanism, you know, and is it not uh, problematic? 
And I want to challenge this unproblematic uh, idea about Europe. Uh, the naturalness of Europe as this uh, place, spontaneous uh, site of uh, humanism and human right. Which doesn't mean that I don't think that Europe is not a refuge, does not represent a refuge and sanctuary today. But nonetheless, Europe, you know, uh, I want to understand how this was fabricated, that was this idea of Europe was fabricated, and how it's taken as naturally, and everyone wants to join that uh, Europe. I've always been interested in the fabrication of consent, that something becomes banalized and natural, and we speak, we say Europe, and we don't think about the history and how this was constituted. What is Europe? So for this is, uh, you know, uh, what I want uh, to talk about, that's my first point. So how Europe is thought as a continent in itself, this idea of, you know, dividing the world into continents, and they were natural, you know, like emerging. And so how in this mapping of the world throughout continent, Africa, Europe, Asia, uh, uh, the Americas, the Caribbean, is uh, in, in fact is emerged also from uh, the colonial history and gave to each continent a place in the hierarchy of civilization, right? A, a place uh, in a specific role in human development. And Europe took that place of, you know, at, at effectively carrying the best, uh, you know, this uh, human development. Even this was in the theory of human geography. If you look at the text, the founding text, of human geography, it's uh, you know this idea of continent. So should we challenge? Should we not challenge this continental thinking? Because Europe, you know, is not a landmass; it's something. So where are the borders of, of Europe? The second uh, point I want to make about Europe that Europe is Western Europe. When we talk about Europe, is Western Europe, and usually Germany, uh, France, and England. Although England now is going in its own way, but it's you know it's usually there is barely the South, you know, Portugal has disappeared from the idea of Europe, Spain, Italy, it's the Renaissance, but after that, you know, Italy does not provide anything. Um, the North is, you know, perhaps two or three philosophers, but not the literature, what is, you know, what is the making of people of, for instance, indigenous community in Finland and Sweden absolutely do not exist. And the East is this place to civilize. Right, the Eastern Europe is this place to civilize. I mean, we there are the little borders that we have, uh, you know, to save. I mean, we. The, so this question of continent, then, so Western Europe um, and the border. Uh, I remember reading texts of the 18th century in which uh, the country of the east of Europe, not Eastern Europe, but of the east of what Europe was constituted as Europe. Was the, uh, you know, was described as barbaric, backward people. There were description of people in Poland that were mirroring the description of, you know, letter of Africa and elsewhere. You know, like people not knowing cleanliness. Then the uh, um, uh, third point about Europe: the whitening of Europe. How Europe became white. You know, what happened to Europe to become white? You know, to be associated to whiteness and Christianity. Of course, there is a moment of expel, you know, expelling the Muslim and the Jews from Spain. That was a very important moment. The erasure of you know, all the contribution from elsewhere to Europe, the anti-Semitism, the anti-Roma, but also, of course, from the 15th century, the slave trade and colonization. That was a very important moment, you know, very important moment. More whitening. Uh, and the role of uh, how the invention of what is to be white, of whiteness, which was already there through anti-Semitism and anti roma but really became through anti-blackness. And that, if we don't uh, look at that, and we do, do think, you know, of, of, of uh, Europe as not white, we don't understand a lot of things. How anti-blackness and the slave trade affected the notion of gender, I mean, being a woman, white or black, was absolutely not the same thing how black women, for instance, in the plantation, were usually working in the worst uh, work on, uh, in the field. Not at all, you know, the image we could have through cinema of seeing them always in the kitchen, the black women in the kitchen, or a domestic, like, in Gone with the Wind. 
they were really in the hardest job on the plantation and in the field of the plantation. They were punished as, as harshly as men. There was not the idea of their other female bodies that should not be. Uh, you know, they were punished as hard. And they were, even, they were not thought, I mean, they were supposed not to have a, a motherhood, you know, like have a maternity feeling. Uh, like black men could not be father. So fatherhood and motherhood were not, they were whitened, also the idea. Uh, what is the idea of the good family? So all this were really deep, deep, were really enter uh, the European mentality. Even patriarchy was rationalized. When we say oh, patriarchy is not, you know, this universal thing. You could be a tyrant at home, and when you went out of your home, you were a black man or indigenous man or an Arab man, and you had, you know, uh, to go down the, you know, in let the room for the for the white man. And the question of private property connected also with whiteness okay, and, and maleness, of course. But all these constructions were really reinforced. Uh, in discourse on colonialism, M. Césaire talk of what he called the boomerang effect of slavery and colonization in Europe. He said you cannot enslave and colonize without the racial law and what you do coming back to you and contaminating your literature, your laws, your, uh, your idea of freedom, of equality, of all, you know, this can, will be effectively affected. And even, as I say in the book, The Colonial Feminism, uh, if, in Europe, the uh, history of women's rights, you know, the, uh, the, the incredible, beautiful history that lead to the, vote, the right to vote, which is really, you know, it, it forget one thing that this woman had the right to for, you know, 15th century. They did not have the right to be surgeon or lawyer or to go to school or to marry what they want or to divorce. They had the right to own human beings. They were slave owners. They were at the head of plantation. And the books have shown that they were very savvy in the, uh, in the market slave. They knew that having slave was a capital. And it was very important for them. So you have even archives showing that the father has bequeathed slave to his daughter. She married, and she kept that capital for them. There was even a contract being signed saying this slave will remain my capital and will not become the capital of my husband. So they absolutely understood that this ownership, this private property of, of, of human being. So there is uh, all this uh, that, uh, so we have to rewrite the story of, of, of right. And of course, the challenge also brought by the Asian Revolution in 18th century, that is story that is erased from the story of the Great Revolution of 18th century the British, the American, and the French Revolution, which are the revolution of the 18th century of the Enlightenment. In the meantime, you have the revolution in Haiti, which is anti-slavery, anti-colonial, anti-racist. And this disappeared from that history. And even though it was a revolution that carried further this idea of freedom of equality, um, even though after, and it was punished for that, as, as, as you know. So this idea of like uh, the whitening uh, of Europe, Europe uh, inventing itself as white and Christian. The question of the wealth of Europe, you know, the, the creation of the wealth of Europe, which came from extraction, which came from exploitation, deportation, and destruction. The fact that you know that the commerce, the slave trade, brought wealth to many parts of Europe, not just France and England. Uh, you had to have, you know, commodity and object to, 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 to trade for the capture of uh, human being. And this, for instance, led, you know, even the, uh, China in, in uh, Bavière, how do you say Bavière in Germany? The, the region of Germany? Bavaria. Bavaria, thank you. Uh, uh, you know, could, uh, you know, sold it. It was very important weapons, which were the iron from Sweden was used. So even country which not directly connected with uh, plantation benefited from the slave trade. It was a huge commerce and use. And then, of course, it totally uh, it supported the, the weapon industry, the, the, you know, the industry of textile. You need a lot of textile for the slave ship. I mean, little, you know, uh, it, it really enriched uh, 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 Europe. And also, it brought to Europe coffee, sugar, uh, tobacco, things that were important, cotton, which became very important. And how even maritime law were based on this, were developed during slave trade. You know, like who has the right to travel? You know, what are the, how do you 
uh, who um, navigate, how you do navigate, how do, where do you port? I mean, the question of insurance, the, the birth of the insurance company where we slave trade because the slave were merchandise, were goods. So if they were lost, the insurance would reimburse, you know, the person who has bought them. So the really development of banking, development of insurance, the plantation is not this little place somewhere on an island or in the United States without connection with the global network of banking, insurance, and capital. So that's very important. The question of transforming, as I say, body uh, as currency and capital, and the, the fact that Africa is also transformed as this uh, unlimited resource of bodies. You know, millions were taken from Africa, million. That means that this, this idea, because of the life expectancy of slaves were seven to eight years in the, on the plantation, so you have to, you know, bring back more. So this was this idea of the lim unlimited resource. And then the idea with reproduction, which uh, I explore in a book called The Womb of Women, Race, Capital, and Feminism. Uh, you, the, you had to need, you know, more force, right? Bonded uh, workforce. And you ha it was interesting because how reproduction is being thought, reproduction of this uh, workforce, bonded workforce. In the United States, um, uh, the United States will hand a slave trade with uh, Africa in 1808. So the slavery will be within the United States, the trade, the slave trade. If some of you have seen the movie 12 Years a Slave or read the book, it's about that. The person is captured in the north and brought back in the south. And so they were, you know, sad. So there were a, a slave breeding industry that developed. You know, women, as soon, uh, black women, as soon as they could carry uh, children, they were raped. And as soon as they were giving birth, they were raped again, so they would. So you have in the archive women, in, they are 15 year old, they have already like three or four uh, pregnancy. So that reproduction. Uh, and this, and in other colony, British and French colony or Portuguese colony, it was bringing people from Africa. You know, so constantly. So then the womb of women was also a capital. It was transformed into a capital, right? Uh, it was very important because it was from there that you have the source. Either the woman in the plantation or the woman of Africa, where, you know, the womb uh, was transformed into a capital. It was also the idea of Europe as unique. It became, you know, it came this idea of the unicity of Europe, the, the natural soil of human rights and women's rights. This was where the idea, the humanism was born, the idea of the human, of humanity, uh, were born. And of course, without, uh, with absolutely ignoring where, where, what, how other people have thought of freedom, equality, community, uh, sovereignty. So, um, um, it led also to uh, the civilizing mission. I mean, I use the French notion, uh, the British call about the white man burden. But the civilizing mission is really what has remained in this idea of effectively there is a duty for Europeans to save and protect and civilize and educate other people. And we can see it is still today. So my last point about, uh, you know, this idea of uh, Europe is to come back to the, even for today, for contemporary moment, the creation of the European community in which we live after World War II and really brought by this idea that it, it came from all this history of a unicity, the specificity of Europe, the land. And, if, and it was very, uh, if you read at the time uh, the the speech by Adenauer or Spark, who was a minister of Belgium and very important uh, person in the creation of the European community. They talk about the superiority of uh, Western civilization, and they mean Western Europe. They talk about that very clearly in all the speech, I mean, in the discussion about the creation of Euro European community, it's really about creating white European community. And how, you know, very racist and how Europe, they, they understand that colonialism is you know, colonial empire will end soon. So how to reintroduce uh, Africa as a dependent without talking about colonialism, you know, changing things so nothing change as we see, you know, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the novel. So how do you build, how Europe built a naturalized and imperialist way of life? 
that became natural for so many Europeans. The idea that, you know, you're entitled, you know, and it's natural if you, if you open the, you know, um, the, ta the water, you know, the, the tap water, you can drink it, you know, and anyway you open, the, it, there is water, there is water. Or you turn on the light, there is a light. And this part of the, you know, this is, and we are entitled, we as European are entitled to that. This should work. And if the rest of the world does not have that, it's because they are underdeveloped and because of themselves and corruption. So you don't, um, you erase effectively the structure how this uh, empire's will have structure the life in the global south and also for minority in the north, right? How the well-being of the majority of the inhabitants in Europe are based on the appropriation and exploitation for a century and for and today in other continent. For instance, in France, uh, there is a lot of talk about the uh, nuclear industry and how this gives France, uh, you know, sovereignty, independence. But France, if it, France was not exploiting the uranium in Niger and therefore destroying and polluting and contaminating, there would be no nuclear industry. So when they talk about the national nuclear industry, they hide the fact that without this exploitation and extraction, you don't have national nuclear industry. So my, my, my all constant effort is to, to pull the thread. You know, there is something that is there, but why is it there? Why, how this is connected with different things? How, you know, what I think, okay, I'm going to there, I'm going to get glasses, and I should get glasses. I have the right to glasses, you know? And, uh, you know, how this is uh, being built. Uh, and uh, at, at the same time, you know, that there is this idea that what Europe has done and what uh, so Césaire uh, said in Discourse on Colonialism, what Achille Mambé uh, wrote in a recent book, or they say, uh, he said, what Europe has done to other people, and especially to Africans, will happen to Europe. That the, some people will become also disposable within Europe. Europeans will think they're going to be protected from that fabrication of vulnerability to premature death or to fragility. They will also get that. And we saw it already a little with the pandemic, you know. We know that the highest rate of death was among community of color and black community and Roma community, but also among the elderly, among some of the people who were who are thought as disposable. Um, so this, uh, uh, I wanted to show a quote by Cesar, and I, of course I don't know how to do that. I'm sorry. Not very. Hello. Okay, no, it's not that one, so, I know, where is Césaire? Oh, Césaire has disappeared. Okay, this is Césaire. This is Césaire when, uh, in the discourse of colonialism, when you see how colonization, the, the point is how colonization colonizes the colonizer. So decolonization is not just for the colonized, it's also at one point for the colonizer. If a colonizer wants to be free, the colonizer has to, also decolonize him, herself, himself. You know, so how this is, you, that is say that colonization cannot be civilization, cannot be, because it brings the, the colonization to fertilize, you know, to, to degrade, to awaken. There is no other possibility because you arrive and you are put into a superior situation that is not connected with anything that you are. But you have the right, you have the right to dominate, you have the right to kill in total impunity. And this effectively will, will effect corrupt the person, right? So, and he say, you know, that the continent will proceed toward savagery. So he returned the accusation of savage that is, you know, brought by the European order to Europe itself. So this, uh, so this is what I wanted to say. Uh, so what Europe do we want then, you know? What is this Europe? Uh, what is anti-racist Europe, you know, uh, what is anti-capitalist Europe, and how even the idea of Europe, this idea of border, which are un today more walls, drones, a militarized border, army on the border, you know, uh, in Greece, in Poland, as we saw uh, last year on the Belarus-Poland border, you know, the thousands of refugees being attacked, in sub-zero temperatures, some of them dying in the forest, you know, women and children. How do we, you know, what is the Europe? 
we want. Do, if we take Europe as, you know, this is Europe. No, this is a certain Europe, this is a Europe. How do we say that, you know, all refugees are welcome? How do we build solidarity, in, you know, international solidarity? Because as you do know, uh, after the invasion of Ukraine, and I'm not talking about, you know, the, the, that it was justified. I'm talking about how refugee, the selection, the differentiation between refugees that went at the border. And even after, when I was in Berlin in August, a refugee from Ukraine had, uh, could stay in Germany until the 31st of August, and then they had to leave. Whereas Ukrainian could find housing, job, send their kids to school. My point is not that they should not have that right. My point is that it will be that all should have the right. So this is really how even the racialization process of racialization go even to refugee today. Who is a refugee with, threat, with a threat to the society? Who is a refugee who is criminalized, who is seen as a threat and threat to women, as we do know, as we saw years ago in Corn, you know, when there was this famous story during Christmas when men refugee had, you know, had, had violated a German woman, and in fact, it was not really that. It was not true. It was not happened like that. But it jumped, and even you know, feminists uh, jump on the thing that this is threatened. Even how uh, this refugee men, uh, men refugee, essentially Muslim, are seen to threaten what women had won, the right that they had won in Europe, and so they seen as a threat. So that's my uh, first point because uh, I want to keep it. So my second point is about um, also connected with that with the representation. As already talked about the way Europe represents itself, and we could talk about all the symbol of the European Union and the European community. Um, but I wanted to talk more uh, to show something that I, uh, I did uh, to, uh, again, how things have been naturalized. And I got interested in how slavery had been represented in art, in European art. And from 15th century, when slave trade and slavery start, to 19th century. And I was interested in what happened in Le Louvre, because this is the most visited museum, the most famous museum in the world. And also, the collection starts in 1793, which is an important uh, date in terms of uh, uh, slavery, the first abolition of slavery in Saint-Domingue, future Haiti, following the uh, start of the revolution. And the collection ends in 1848. After that, it's at the Musée d'Orsay. It's considered entering the modern, you know, modernism. And 1848 is the second and final abolition of slavery in the French colony. Because in between, Napoleon re-established slavery in 1802, right? He re-imposed slavery. So I said, perfect, this collection is perfect. You know, let, let's see, because it's two moments, and, and also because the 18th century in Europe is the moment of the highest number of African being deported. Uh, 15th, 16th, 17th century, it will be uh, 30 to 40,000 African deported every year. In the 18th century, you move to 70 to 90,000 per year. So at the moment of the revolution of the Enlightenment, of the idea of liberty and equality among men, men, it was men, you have that highest. So that was interesting. And it's the highest development of the plantation, of the plantation economy. So I wanted to say, you know, what was the visual culture of West and how we are trained to see so we do not see. Because when I went to see the curator at Le Louvre, they said to me, but we don't have any painting about slavery. This is not a museum about slavery. As if you know, then it will be in the Museum of Slavery that you will find the representation of slavery. I say, but I know you are not the Museum of Slavery, but I want to see, and I don't want you to go to the, you know, to, to some basement and find this small painting. I want to see, I want to see how all the slavery transformed the visual culture and did it. So for me, it was. Uh, to look, for instance, uh, when do you have the first painting of a man smoking a pipe? Which means when has tobacco enter in the culture and, and also in the representation of masculinity? Because for whatever reason in Europe, tobacco became associated with masculinity. You smoke, you are a man. And women could not smoke for a long time, could not smoke in public until the mid-20th century. 
unless you were a sex worker or a revolutionary. Which was, you know, at, we should we should we should start to smoke again, perhaps, you know. So that was important. It was also to look at the, uh, when do you start to have coffee, um, uh, go, you know, teapot, uh, coffee pot, a uh, sugar bowl, uh, because even that, you know, because before that you don't need them. So how the the, the really the social, cultural, aesthetic life is being transformed. And therefore, how it appears in the painting, but without the story, for instance. So that the, uh, the first painting will be, it's a little earlier than that, but this is mostly, this is uh, Grimaud, is a French painter, but the first really painting will be Dutch. You know, Dutch, beginning of the 17th century, you start to see tobacco, you start to see sugar board, you start to see, you know, this. And so, for me, that was that. So, of course, when people were, so the, we all, I organized this visit, it was guided visits called the Slave in the Louvre, an invisible humanity. And when we arrived in front of the painting, people just said to me, well, it's a portrait of a man smoking. And I say, but what is the date? And why do you have tobacco? Well, there was tobacco. But where could tobacco come from? You know, you don't have tobacco. Tobacco is not, you know, cultivated in Europe. So for me, it was interesting how effective the connection could not be made. You know, that in fact, you do not see what is under uh, your eyes. So that was interesting. This painting by Franz Post was for me the most interesting. Franz Post uh, it was a, a Dutch painter who went with a, a Prince of Orange, you know, because the north east of Brazil was a Dutch colony uh, at the time. And he, he went with another uh, painter, and uh, they were they had to paint, you know, uh, uh, landscape. And these are big, big paintings. So, uh, and when uh, the prince uh, came back to Europe, he gave many to uh, Louis XIV. So many are in uh, in France. This is why you you have. And they are big painting. And the, for me, you know, they, it, it transforms slavery into a landscape. You know, so you see black people here, but they are in the landscape, they're part of the decor, you know, and you don't, so it's, and they are quite a beautiful painting, and they were the first painting also bringing, you know, exotic landscape to, to Europe, you know, with the palm tree and all the, uh, and he painted a lot of this, and for me, it's very interesting because when we work in front, of, uh, there, there are eight paintings together in, uh, in one of the gallery of Le Louvre, it was very interesting to have the, the reaction of the public, you know, and to see what they saw and did not see. Because for them, to see black people in Brazil was, was natural, because they connected with Brazil today. And it's like, but do you think you had black people in Brazil? You know, like, when did they arrive? And so the, the fact all this was, so the, this way of showing, of, because in fact, it's, it's not hidden, right? But then you don't see. And this was I interested. So here you see the plantation here, you know, it's a plantation, it's a river. The fact that plantations were qu quite often built beside river, because then the sugar will go, or the tobacco, or, you know, will, will travel to the port. And then you see them walking. So how this, you know, uh, become uh, naturalized. So uh, this was my, uh, what I, I wanted to, to show. And these are not in, uh, in uh, Le Louvre, these are Musée de Nantes, but I, what I thought what is interesting is the fact is the portrait. These are very wealthy people connected with a slave trade, a couple, you will see the men after that. And what you see effectively, she has coffee. The slave is bringing sugar. This is, you know, to show the exotic. Her dress is silk, with the, you know, so the connection with India. And so, and, and she has the color of servitude you know, because a slave should have that, you know. Uh, and as you see, most of the painting, uh, the slave is not looking at you. They are never represented facing as, you know, as a full person. So they're always represented looking at the master. They, they, you know, their existence is through. And so this painting, I mean, the fact that this, this couple represented themselves naturally, naturalized that, the fact, this is in Nantes, and they were in Nantes, the fact to have a slave person in their house and this representation and coffee and sugar because it's wealth, it's status, you know, it's status to have that. And so how this became uh, very important. And this is the man, 
And the same thing, you have the young uh, black slave looking at him. He's there. He has a little dog somewhere, and he has his hand on a, on contract. So you have the law, the 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 man, the patriarch. You have books behind, you know, and uh, you have he has a, the color of servitude also, and he's looking at his master. So this is was how you know the uh, you had the painting. So my point was you don't do you need to re literally represent slavery to see slave to see the presence of the slave. Slavery, I mean, the slave is represented through abolitionist uh, iconography, especially British, 19th century. They understand, the, the British abolitionists understood the power of the image, the power of representation. They understood very well, and they, they really use it. So for instance, you have the slave ship, the Brooks, which was the first representation of the slave ship with the slave, you know, side by side like that. It was very important. But they understood that they had uh, to focus on suffering and pain. So to, to really mobilize opinion. So if you visit Museum of Slavery, you will visit Museum of the Tool of Enslavement. And so you, because this has to be represented this way. So you will barely see who was a human being who was enslaved. The fact that that person continued to, to, to have feelings, to fall in love, to, 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 you know, to dream. So this is also the question of, of, you know, of representation, which for me is important that we can see. And then, uh, so um, for me, that definition of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who is an abolitionist, a geographer, is very important. You know, the, the exploitation of vulnerability to premature death in distinct and densely connected political geography. It's very important to study how the, the vulnerability to premature death is constructed and how it's different from one place to the other, but nonetheless is that, at the, at the art of the question of racism is that. How do you fabricate vulnerability to premature death? And it becomes naturalized, it becomes banalized. You know? The fact that, uh, as you may know, Life is shorter for workers everywhere in the world, right? But not only so the popular classes, but the black community, indigenous community, their life is shorter. The children in the global south are born with much more report respiratory disease than in the north. So being, you know, fragile to life because their lungs are small lungs, they have, you know, respiratory disease. Uh, or born with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, physical and mental problems. So how effectively, and this is as if, oh, this is poverty. But how, you know, so uh, we saw that. And also the technology on anti-relationality, I think, is also in, very important to, to, because one of the things is, how are we going to live together? Uh, you know, one of the topic of, uh, and, uh, and so this question of how to rebuild relationality in a world that is, uh, supporting anti-relationality. How, you know, effectively, uh, the life is separated and reconnected in a way that feed the production of capital and wealth. So we are not reconnected through solidarity. Um, uh, one of the things of representation, also what I was interested in, I, I, uh, I mentioned it, is the fact of the, uh, banali the weaponization of uh, black and uh, brown and body, for instance, the refugee, you know, the weaponization. And how, for instance, during the Belarus Poland uh, event, uh, uh, the Polish government talked of a hybrid war. You know, so these people were launching a war, you know, but hybrid. So, and so th these people were not people, were not human beings. They were part of an army, some kind of mass army sent by the Belarus dictator uh, against uh, Europe. And how this is extremely important to effectively to dismantle that proposition. Uh, the question of representation, I don't know for uh, this part of the world, but in uh, Germany, France, UK is very strong, is uh, what is called art washing. Our art is used to, uh, in fact, support neoliberalism, to gentrify popular neighborhood, to, you know, to all this. So the art washing has become, and how private foundations are playing a very important role. After fabricating the vulnerability for artists, 
the private foundation arrive and offer money and who can say no, you know, you're in precarity and then you know how it's being used and you know, for the gentrification. And how this, this question of uh, um, how neoliberalism has understood much more than conservative in many ways, that uh, diversity and inclusion are, in, that are important to push, you know, because it will not threaten uh, capitalism, it will not threaten exploitation. Why don't we have, you know, women at the head of corporation? Why don't we have black people or Asian people, just, you know, so state and corporate feminism are also the place. So all this is very, uh, for me, important to, uh, to look at and to, and to see uh, all this form of what I call pacification, you know, all this. So the last uh, point I want to make so we, we can have uh, some discussion is uh, decolonial feminism. I don't know if I have more things, no. Oh, that was just a zone of non-being that are, I think, multiplying in Europe. Uh, and uh, Fanon saw it in the colony, but how this is, uh, for me, for instance, the camp in Greece, or the camp in ex-Yugoslavia, or the camp, our zone of non-being, you know, the, or this place for refugee, our zone of non-being, and certainly. So um, how do you, how will we think that, the fact that they are brought, been brought back to Europe, they are no longer in the colony. So that, uh, uh, so decolonial feminism. So from uh, decolonial, I mean, we, you may know all the, you know, theory from Walter Mignolo, Enrique Dussel, Maria Lugones, and also. I don't situate myself so much in that tradition. Uh, for me, uh, it's, uh, it's connected with anti-colonialism and how colon the colony remains absolutely, uh, the colonization is still very important in the making of the world. Uh, the neoliberal world, you know, you, talk, you hear about colonizing Mars and the moon. I mean, the question of colonization, of expanding, of the need to expand, the need to fabricate new uh, goods, new commodities, new commodification, is absolutely, it has to be limitless. And when it's hand, capitalism dies. I need to, be, you know, fabricate new commodity. So for me, decolonization is a process. It's not something, you have the moment of independence, and they were extremely important, but independence is not decolonization, was not decolonization. So decolonization is much more deeper. Uh, it's a historical process, is really, uh, finance is a program of total disorder, and disorder is not chaos, is effectively uh, challenging. Uh, you know, quite often we hear today, this is the end of the world, you know, because of the climate change and everything. And uh, for, to which I answer, yes, we want the end of this world, not of the world but of this world in which we live. Yes, we want the end of that one. But the end of this world is not the end of the world. We want another world. And to, for that other world to live, we have to have the end of this world. And so we have to dare to think the end of this world, which will not mean the end of the world. So how to effectively dismantle deeply that world, the world we live in, that will not threaten the possibility of another world. Decolonial feminism is also, for me, a form of emancipatory utopia. Some uh, years ago, I worked on a workshop with uh, artists, which I do quite often, and it's, it was about the question of utopia. It was at a moment, was like five, six years ago, when you were hearing, uh, oh God, you know, anti-colonialism was wrong, radical feminism was wrong, uh, you know, uh, all this, finally, they were dreaming, you know, they were naive people, things will not change, this is where the world is going. So, the, in fact, for me, it was, uh, um, you should not dream, you should not imagine something else, right? It was like, don't, you know, the world is like that, play with your apps, you know, get, get, get fun with all this thing, and, you know, why do you need more? And so I thought about that, and so I, I proposed for this uh, workshop uh, to think about dystopia, utopia. And my argument was the, uh, in uh, the genre, the literature genre in the West, utopia always ends in dystopia. You know, it ends badly. It starts with a beautiful idea, and always it ends badly because human nature is like that, right? So it ends very badly. And so my argument was, well, you know, a lot of people in the world has lived in dystopia for centuries, you know. Uh, dystopia is their way of life. So they have the right to build utopia in uh, emancipatory utopia. 
wishes for me, for instance, of thinking a, a poetic of the future, imagining the possible in a world of the impossible. Of what is said to be impossible, then you say, no, it's possible. That imp what you say is impossible can be thought as possible. What is presented as impossible should be challenged and say, yes, it's possible. You know, uh, uh, equality, liberty, you know, um, uh, all of this. Uh, uh, but it's effectively, it, it requires a leap of imagination that is quite difficult to make because even imagination is constrained, you know, like uh, don't be naive, you know. All the imagination is in the Marvel movie, you know, with like the Superman or whatever, people flying through the things or, you know, and, and fighting dragon. And so this is, you know, this is the world of the future, but the future is here on, you know, like here, here on, on Earth. So how do we think in a, world, in a moment of an incredible multiple crisis around the world, multiple crisis, of what I call a state of permanent war now. Not just the war which means bombing the tank, rape and torture, but the war that is, you know, uh, you cannot breathe. Uh, when I read last year that more people are dying every year of air pollution than of any other cause, I say, wow, you know. So it made me think how the world is unbreathable. The world is uninhabitable. The world is made unbreathable and uninhabitable. So how breathing become a revolutionary struggle? The right to breathe, the right to breathe and to open your lung and to, you know, and how breathing, you know, uh, breathing is, I can, I can breathe, of course, but as we know, this was related to murder and police violence, but also how in political uh, authoritarian regime, you say, we can breathe, you know, the, 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 the metaphor, of you, you can breathe because censorship you know, constrain your lungs. You cannot speak it's as if something here. <laughs> you cannot speak. And then breathing is then you can speak again. You can sing. You can shout. You can. Uh, so uh, how breathing is connected effectively with this emancipatory utopia. So uh, decolonial feminism is this possibility of thinking uh, the possible in the moment of what around us is, you know, a world that not only has naturalized oppression, uh, domination, extraction, and exploitation, but also of compounded crisis. So it's not just this, you know, crisis or that. It's like we see, you know, every morning, if we look at the news, wherever we turn, we see a terrible catastrophe. So how do we confront? And uh, I was having this image, you know, of uh, looking at the monster and not be petrified. You know, not, not being petrified by the incredible cruelty. The, you know, that fact that, oh my God, I, you know, like, I, I cannot see it. And how I'm going to look at it, and I'm going to confront it, and I say, yes, this, the monster is a monster, and destroy. It's destruction, it's about death and destruction. But then this is what I need to understand. I need to see, I cannot underestimate it to be able to know how to fight. And finally, decolonial Europe for me is also today in Europe, because we are in Europe, is uh, how do we create refuge and sanctuaries? Again, in a very hostile environment, a world that is hostile to gay, to queer, to sex workers, to trans, to Roma, to poor. How do we build? And when I think about refuge and sanctuary, it's effectively the emergency of finding a place to rest or, you know, to get. But it's also a place where you can read, it can be a bookstore, it can be a library, it can be a cafe, it can be a publishing house, it can be, you know, a place, uh, you know, a place where you can dance, a place where you, it's really like to find joy again in a world that is, you know, forbidding joy. And also rest. Uh, I, was, uh, I was struck, and this is, will be my last, um, um, talking with um, refugee and migrant, uh, how they were telling uh, that uh, they were constantly sleeping with one eye open, you know, because of fear of what happened and not totally sleeping. And how incredibly important for them to find a place where they knew that they could put their head on the pillow and really sleep and, and feel safe. And since every one of us know what it is to need to sleep and to sleep well, to find rest and not to be constantly, 
I thought that this question of rest also was a very in, in, important question. How, what is the right to rest? And what is the right to have, you know, our body, let it go and, you know, like be able to sleep in total, like sleep, not, not sleep because you're exhausted, but the good sleep of rest, you know. So all this for me, the refuge and sanctuary, how we need to build them uh, today and how we need to create them to, uh, as, as space of utopia, an emancipatory of utopia, space of effectively uh, recouping and getting more energy and courage and being able. But also a place you, you could find uh, fake papers. We will have to learn to do fake papers today with all these kind of things. You know, we need uh, people who will know how to do that. Uh, but also we know already that people find road and itinerary. You know, like this underground railroad who you are, that we have also to support. So uh, the decolonial feminism is not today for me. It's really the not yet, but the not yet which is possible, which we have to fight for. And it's a daily work. It's a daily struggle. It's um, we do not. It, it's long. It's difficult, uh, but it's also full of joy. It's really full of joy. Thank you. Let me welcome you to the second part of tonight's lecture and Q&A. It was a fascinating journey through uh, what we call European civilization. Thank you very much. Uh, we just prepared a few questions, but I think that we'll jump very soon into the things that you would like to ask Francois. So I perhaps would like to start with, um, uh, with the meaning of decolonization for Slovak audiences and for those of us who are here and perhaps identify ourselves as those of Slovak citizenship or having, I don't know, permanent residency here in Slovak Republic. So uh, I think that when you wrote a decolonial feminism and when writing your books, the audience that you had in mind was primarily uh, French. Uh, the books were originally written, or at least a de decolonial feminism. I don't know about the uh, theory of violence, but these were books addressed primarily uh, to, to French audiences. So, and you wanted to make your audience uh, aware of um, the history and legacy of colonialism and how it actually makes the everyday lives of, of Fran French citizens uh, 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 possible. But um, maybe this will be a bit controversial, but I think that this is something that uh, pops uh, in many of our minds is that Slovakia never was a colonial force, or at least it wasn't explicitly a colonial force. I mean, like, we had a national hero, Milan Rastislav Stefanik, who, uh, who participated on, col on colonialism as uh, a member of the French army and the French uh, state, uh, state administration. But Slovakia or Czechos well, Slovakia was never really a colonial force. And the, uh, the, this country even has a narrative of being under the oppression, being under the yoke of other empires and imperial forces, such as, for example, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, then the Soviet Empire, uh, USSR, uh, after the Second World War. And some nationalists would even claim that Slovakia was under the yoke of the Czech, uh, uh, of the, of the, of, of, of Czech powers in, uh, uh, in Czechoslovakia. So, for me, the question is, as we were not so explicitly entangled, I'm not saying that we were not really implicitly entangled in, colonial, in colonialism, so what is the lesson for us? What lesson shall we take uh, here in Slovakia? Um, that's, oh. it, that's, uh -huh. that's, that's, that's a question easy. to be on. That's quite okay. easy, yeah, because first, uh, Europe, whether, you're a colonial, whether, you're, whether you are a colonial force or not a colonial force, you belong to Europe and you want to be part of this Europe. And then you want to be part of an empire that got its wealth. So you would not benefit from the wealth of that Europe, European community that is built on extraction and exploitation. So even that your place is, you know, hierarchically not as good as the French, whatever, nonetheless, you're gonna be in that, in that frame. You, 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 you uh, give allegiance to imperialism, that's one thing. Second, if the Slovakians think of them as colonized, then they have to live an anti-colonial struggle. They have to lead a decolonial struggle. 
the decolonial uh, Europe is effectively the fight of, you know, both the, co the colonial in Europe, and Europe is full of former colonized. It's full. So it's not, it's not for me the south and the north. In the north today, you have a lot of minorities, uh, uh, people, uh, descendant of migrant, of, uh, you know, minority of colors, as we say, uh, that effectively are fighting against uh, the coloniality of power in Europe. So the, my question of decolonial has nothing to do with the history, really, like France or whatever. And I was, of course, speaking in France, and I started, but when I started the, with the question, who cleaned the world, is not a French question. The, who cleaned the world cannot be a French question. It's really like a, a, a global economic question. But to go back to more your, your very specific question, the narrative of being under the yoke, and then therefore the Slovakia could look at uh, what was this yoke, in, in, in which way? Uh, was, did, uh, were there consent? How consent was built to that, uh, uh, or how part of the Slovakian perhaps, you know, consented? So what the empire brought nonetheless certain advantage or privilege or whatever uh, so. And how dissent then was built? What kind of dissent was the political uh, terrain of that dissent? Uh, it was uh, what was the aim and objective of that dissent to build what kind of uh, society? Uh, was it effectively, okay, we get out of this yoke but to enter a European community, which is another form of empire? So it's, you know, what do you want to build from the situation? And today, for me, you know, France is not France. I mean, France is France, of course. But the point I feel myself much more connected with all the people in Europe who are oppressed in Europe by Europe, not just you can come from Senegal. You're in France. You're not, you be, you are there in France. So the, your struggle is being there, you know. And uh, so there is a struggle of to decolonize Europe, and and there are. Uh, possibility of an alliance between uh, anti-racist Slovakian uh, forces and anti-racist forces in Italy and uh, in Greece. That will be what form of internationalism we're going to build in Europe among those of us who really want to change this. We don't want the anti-refugee, anti-migrant uh, uh, politics, but also uh, the anti-woman politics. Or the, you know, all this and how they are connected, um, uh, because just saying uh, we want to join Europe, what what Europe do we want to join? Uh, do we want the, the Europe of resistance or Europe of the uh, of the Parliament and uh, European Community, which we do know as you know enforced laws that uh, are absolutely antisocial law, absolutely antisocial law. So it's a, I will say that it's not a contradiction for Slovakia for Slovakia. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I I very much uh, I very much concur with your idea of basically like critically interrogating this idea of Europe because the idea of Europe that we've been accustomed to at least those of us who've been through the period of I don't know accession of Slovakia to the EU we access this very uh, like unquestioned and unquestionable project of a civilized uh, European Union that we are finally joining as those from the as those from the East. So I think it's really great to see that or really critically interrogate, okay, this Europe that we were joining uh, has its own, I'm not saying dark sides, but it has its contradictions and really um, um, uh, legacies that are worth uh, really interrogating in order to see what kinds of ideals and norms we are pledging allegiance to. Yeah, you, I mean, what is this European community that we are joining? You know, and so it's not just okay. Let's let's have a rupture with with that part of of the world we live. I mean, that landmass in which we live, uh, and which was part of what oppressed us, Soviet Union, and then move toward the West. But this West has a history. This West is a, is a racist construction and has racist laws today. Uh, and, and absolutely, it's brutal, is, is having uh, waging war outside in Africa. So is this the Europe we want to join? Just because we want, so the point is, of course, uh, that master was brutal. Okay, let's move to a master that is less brutal or, you know, appear less brutal. 
But that master, perhaps, will not invade you, whatever, but will impose some laws and uh, neoliberalism and gentrification that will go against. So the point is, like, how do we, if, at, at one point, the, uh, the Europe, uh, uh, Europe um, say we have principle. And so we can say, oh, you have this principle? Okay, apply them. Okay? And so push Europe to its contradiction, which a lot of people do. But then we know that we want to go further than that. We want another Europe, because that Europe is not is absolutely a, a Europe that bring, does not bring you know uh, joy to a lot of people. Uh, we saw how uh, Germany treated Greece during the crisis with absolutely total brutality and without one minute of empathy. So this can happen to any country in Europe. It can happen, I mean, at the moment when Europe wants to put down the law, it will do it. It will not do it by sending army, they don't do that anymore, but it will do by, you know, uh, taking away things, imposing privatization. They have imposed privatization in Greece, total privatization. There is more poverty in Greece. There is a, the industry being sold to everyone. Is this, you know, uh, so effectively Greece is part of Europe. It's absolutely a European country. So, but in what was the cost? The cost is incredible, it's very high. And, and so when you have forces, movement in Greece fighting, they are not fighting against uh, what, what is presented as humanism. They are fighting against neoliberal Europe, which is absolutely ready to, and they are imposing it to Italy. And what is Europe doing today? Is giving money to Libya, to Morocco, to, uh, to stop the migrants, you got 35 migrants being killed by the Moroccan police, you know, some months ago in June and July. It's, you know, and the money giving to Libya. So they can stop. So the, and the Libyan uh, Coast Guard, uh, it pushed people into. So we cannot accept that Europe. So um, Slovakia, uh, which has been under the Australian, uh, has a history of being uh, a peripheral territory within different empires. Uh, cool also, rather than saying, okay, we want also now to be with a big boss. What is a periphery? And from the periphery, do we want to be in the center? How do our periphery and center are being built? And what is the strength of being a periphery? And how do we work? You know, how periphery is not just, you know, weakness. It's weakness within that uh, frame. But how periphery can be, uh, uh, that marginal position can be a position of strength and force. So uh, rather than wanting to be like the other, to be like the German or the French, you know, what is to be a Slovakian from a decolonized point of view, an anti-racist point of view, in connection with different forces through Europe, I will say. So if I may conclude, or if I want to draw a lesson for myself from what you just said, so um, this would mean that building another Europe is possible, that building another Europe means uh, being engaged in struggles uh, in struggles and solidarities that uh, take place between uh, peripheries, between exchanging experience of the peripheries uh, and, and their struggle with, with, with the center, with the metropolis. They are against, yes, so periphery or those who are built as marginal or marginalized community. And then uh, perhaps the Europe we want will not have these borders, will not end also the way in which the border pit nation against nation or state against state. You know, it's a divide to rule thing. So uh, the Europe, the, the post-racist, post-capitalist Europe may not have the same borders. But as I said, Dihan, it's this leap of imagination that also we, want, we need to do. What will be the Europe that will not be that Europe? You know, and what will be? And the Europe is on this huge landmass, right? How are we going to work out this? How are we going to work out so there is environmental justice, there was reproductive justice, there was social justice. How do we do that, you know? Um, so the question of solidarity also, of course, as you say, from the periphery, so how are we going to support women in Poland when they are fighting for, again, the incredible laws, but also how are we going to uh, fight with refugees in Germany? Or, you know, how do we, uh, a constant uh, reflection on the way in which uh, Europe reinforces borders, reinforces marginalization, or a periphery to dominate. 
but periphery uh, can be effectively the site from which the center is being challenged. I would like to ask, uh, you mentioned already the, the, the question, uh, which is very important uh, for reimagining uh, Europe and thinking about uh, another Europe. And this is also opening a question for your uh, book, The Colonial Feminism. And the question is, who cleans the world? So I would like to get back to, to, to this question, which is very important, uh, and to ask what this very simple question uh, and very important one can tell us uh, basically about structures of society, about global capitalism and its local manifestations, but also about people um, as well. Yeah, for, uh, working in the world is for me um, a question I constantly ask because otherwise we go to abstract construction. And as I say, uh, uh, if, if not, if women, mostly women, and this is, you know, according to, to data, it's not just in my mind, do not every day, early in the morning or late at night, clean the university, the school, the hospital, uh, the commercial, the shop, um, the restaurant, the hotel, whatever, the society will stop, will not function. It's not just to pick up garbage in the street. That it's really, it will not function. You're not going to drop your kid in daycare if that has not been clean. You're not going to go to the hospital, you know, so all this. So it's, it's essential to the functioning of a society. Absolutely. It's underpaid, it's undervalued, it's totally surexploited. It's gendered, deeply gendered, it's deeply rationalized. So what do we do with that? How do we transform it into a political question and not just uh, better pay, which is, okay, this, uh, <laughs> this has to be done. Better pay, better li working condition, better living condition. That's a given. But then the question remains, who cleaned the world? Who will clean the world? And uh, as I was saying to you earlier, the cleaning for me is not just cleaning the dirt or, you know, like washing the dishes and, the, and doing the laundry in the hotel. It's also how we're going to clean the world that has been made so dirty by colonialism and imperialism. The amount of waste, the, the damage done to the world, to the river, the pollution of river, the pollution of soil, the pollution of mine, I mean, the pollution of mountain, or, you know, everywhere. The world is, has been made dirty, is unclean, in the sense of this uncleanliness is dangerous for the health. It's not just, you know, that you have a piece of, you know, like whatever dirt in the corner, but well, you can live with it, right? Uh, it's okay. No, it's made the world effectively very dangerous, very threatening to the health of many people. How this will be clean? And so that cleaning, that question of cleaning, because sometimes when I listen to the green people, it's absolutely, you know, like something will be done, but how, yeah, but who will do it? How is this going to be done? You know, it's a, we move to the things, you know, but uh, between that dirtiness and, and uh, who's going to do it? How is this work going to be done? By whom? And this is totally, uh, you know, because effectively cleaning is not seen as a political question in the sense of the, organ the social organization, the political, the economic organization of the society. And therefore, I've been pushed. And then uh, feminist, the bourgeois, uh, feminism was about mostly um, domestic sharing at home. You know, who is doing the laundry, who is cooking for the kids. And of course, it's important. But then by just reducing that to the domestic sphere, totally made invisibilize that other work, which is social work and social reproduction. By putting just social reproduction at home, was forgetting social reproduction outside and has been. So for me, that question of cleaning, the, who cleans the world, was a question about, uh, that is again, for me, from this uh, banal question, uh, you pull so many threads that touch upon gender, upon race, about class, about the environment, about the chemical industry, about um, the body, you know, the exhaustion of the body, uh, about um, um, the condemnation to premature death, you know, about the, the externalization of waste, you know, the, the West dump a lot of West, uh, West the West, <laughs> <laughs> on the South, right? Uh, we know, for instance, in Accra, 
uh, uh, whole part of Accra is the dumping for digital waste. And when you go there, all the soil is red, everything is red, the river is red, you know, from copper. Is, is, is a, you don't need to do science fiction film, you don't need to do dune, you know, you go there and you see it. Or you go to uh, Bangladesh when they, uh, you know, uh, dismantle ships, you know. And it's the same thing, of it. so it's, it's, it's done as we talk. Uh, one of the most uh, waste produ production is fast fashion. It's everyday ton of clothes, and they are very long to, uh, to uh, they, they don't you know, disappear like that. So it, it gets into the soil and gets, you know, and, and it's uh, being bleached or whatever. So, it's, so we, we, I think we need to make it visible the point to which uh, capitalism has wasted earth and how capitalism is a production of waste and not of goods, uh, contrary to what we think, or that, we, that is presented. Um, and, uh, and so how are we going to resolve that question? So less production, of course, but nonetheless, we have to clean also what has been dumped for a century. And is that a question that is a part of a, uh, yeah, for me, of the transformation of the world of this, uh, um, yeah, emancipatory utopia? Um, man is not just, you know, giving better salary to clean, to people who clean. That's, that justice. That's, that just, you know, that's pure justice, you know. But uh, yes, you're right. It's a very deep question and it's not very easy uh, to find the way uh, how we're going to do it. But it, uh, and um, for me, it's also connected to how do we think, uh, because there is a lot of, of discussion and talk today about reparation, all form of reparation. And how do we think the irreparable? Is there, you know, what, is, what do we do with the irreparable? Uh, that cannot be repaired too fast. Or perhaps there is a part of what has been damaged which will ne never be repaired. What, how do we work in a decolonial way with this irreparable? Um, with not just uh, the damage on the earth, but the lives that have been wasted, the memory that have been erased, uh, the, so many people who die without sepulture, they, we, you know, they have disappeared, you know. They, how do we deal with this irreparable, you know? And, um, how the irreparable is not then uh, just um, a site or just a, um, a depress, you know, like a source of depressive uh, 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 feelings uh, or a, a, a mourning that never stopped, that never had, you know, and melancholia, uh, but living with it. How do we going to learn also to live with the fact? That if tomorrow we could, you know, okay, dream, let's dream, clean the world, that the reparation of the world will take generation, because it took centuries to damage it like that way. So, it, so that's also part of the thing. So that uh, the the emancipatory utopia is not about you know uh, the kind of uh, uh, fast cleaning, you know, uh, let's speak like that and it's become you know shiny. Uh, there will be rust. There will, we will ha there will be ruins, you know. But ruination is not is not is not the end either, you know. So, um, how do you live? We're going to live in the ruins of capitalism without falling into melancholy. You again mentioned like so many um, important things uh, in relation to memory and bodies and, and time, but probably we can uh, give floor to to audience and to your questions. Um, so, yes, please go ahead. Uh, I have a questions uh, regarding uh, art history because we we have seen some uh, uh, some artworks in a in a different light that we are used to, and. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, uh, to see uh, what the art history can do in this uh, in this topic because, uh, in my opinion, art history is able to uh, rethink or reestablish our 
our view of our history, of our heritage, and our point of view of, of us today. Uh, so I think it's very important to uh, to rethink the, the pictures, but uh, in a other, on the other hand, it's history. We cannot change it. We cannot uh, cancel it. Uh, so how how can uh, art history, as as an, uh, as a professional field, can deal with uh, with this in a day-to-day -day praxis? Thank you. Well, uh, as you do know, there have been a lot of work around art history to make it less Western, less male. Uh, centered. I mean, this a uh, huge movement around that. There is a huge movement also in museum. Uh, but we have to be. Uh, what you are talking about uh, is um, uh, if in in a museum uh, today, you know, is the is the European museum? Can we decolonize the European museum, or is it a lost cause? Right. So they're going to be there because they are. You go. You know, we're not going to destroy them. We are not. That it's not the point. But how do we transform the art history that this museum are telling? You know, there is art history in the curriculum, and this is 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 experiencing a lot of change, as I say. You know, by people bringing women, bringing you know uh, what is what. A whole art from Africa, Asia, interrogate the art history, da da da, and, and the question of the genius and the individual, you know, like you know, uh, the painter as as a genius. So all these questions are being raised. So uh, I will not get into that. For me, it's more, for instance, the Louvre. At the beginning, they wanted to say, "Oh, we're going to ask a contemporary artist to put some painting." I say, "No, that's washing. That's art washing." You know, and this this exists, and you know, and so for me, it's like they should not be taken away, and uh, but we should learn to see, and um, and it's not to take them out. Some of them are really for me, for instance, past painting. I I found them beautiful, but so for me, it's not the question. It's you know, um, how hard contributing to washing uh, exploitation to make it uh, uh, aesthetic, uh, 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 how slavery became a landscape. And then uh, the second question is how you represent slavery. Uh, it's another question. It's a difficult question. Um, and it's mostly a contemporary artists who are working, which is interesting what they are doing. But uh, how do you represent slavery? How do you represent domination, usually? How you represent domination, you know, sexism? How do you represent that? So we are, that's another question. Uh, the question of representation is a very important question. And um, how do you work also with, uh, with the lack uh, of a document and archive, for instance? That's another question also. If you want to represent something for which you lack document and archives, when I was working on a museum in Reunion Island, in my country, uh, it was about how the, the, that island has been populated. And the French brought uh, enslaved from uh, Madagascar and the east coast of Africa. Nothing has been, no material object remained from their presence, none. You don't even have cemetery. You don't know where they have been. The thousands of men and women who were brought on this island as if like they disappeared. So the question was, how do we how are we going to talk about in the museum? What we're going to do? Most of the other museum, even in Martin, whatever, has gone through, uh, as I say, the representation of enslavement, which is not the same thing for me. So you got chains, you got you know uh, the laws, you got you know the uh, the the act of selling. I mean, you know what what all the tool to enslave. And uh, so we did not want that, and we did not want also to pay for, you know, like a thousand of euro to buy the authentic uh, act uh, of, of selling. But then it was mostly we ask ourselves, okay, what do we do? Because you don't have object. And in Europe, the object tells the story. You have an object, it's going to tell the story of peasant, of uh, 
of uh, people who carve silver or you know of, uh, jewelry or uh, so you got to look. And so I suggested a museum without object. I suggested not to start from the object. If we did not have object, rather than looking absolutely for the object and water, we will not start from the object, but for the narrative. So this is also about art history. It's not because you don't have object that you did not have an aesthetic or you did not have you know, a creation. So how do we work? with a lack which is not an absence. It's not because you don't, you're lacking that there is an absence in the sense of, you know, it does not exist. And so this is for me the question of representation as to be really work every time with relation to, the, to what do we want to represent and how we want to represent it. Uh, every time uh, there have to be, and also uh, an ethic, what is the ethic of representing? You know, to what extent, you know, you're going to represent suffering, which is going to be reproducing the suffering, you know, the image, transforming suffering into an image. So all these ethical questions are, are part also of the question of, you know, within the art world today, and they are very important, very important. But for the, for the painting of before, they exist. We're going to not burn them. We are not, you know, that's not the point. It's mostly... I don't think we will be able to change this museum. I don't see ourselves being able to change the, the big museum of, of London, Berlin, and elsewhere, which are full of uh, stolen objects, you know, from, from wars and from uh, colonialism. A lot of the, I mean, it's, it, I am always impressed when I visit museums all over, you know, in Europe to see how many, in, I don't know, some lost, museum in small city in Sweden, I'm going to see African object. So, you know? So it's like they emptied a, a continent. So what do we do with that? There is a question of restitution right now, you know, to return the object, and why not? But then, um, will it be to reproduce the model of the museum and, you know, that the object telling the story and that if you have object, it tell you the degree of human, you know, civilization you have reached. So it raises all this question. And the question of ethic is also uh, why should objects be shown as if they have, they have no um, life? Uh, and they can be destroyed. Oh, that was used for that ritual, whatever. But, you know, uh, should they be there? You know? And um, uh, indigenous community in Canada and Australia have come up with some uh, principle, ethical principle. So when in, in uh, Vancouver, in the museum, some objects are hidden. I mean, you have the, the text, but you don't see the object is in a box. And it's explaining that the indigenous people to which that object you know, is, they don't know yet if they wanted to show it or to take it back. They are thinking about it. Then there are objects that, they can, that the indigenous people can take and go to, to rooms that have been uh, done for that and do their ritual, and the object disappear the time of doing the ritual and also after the time you know that the object is being invested with things before coming back. Then there are objects that the indigenous people want back. There's no discussion, they don't want to negotiate, they want them back. Then there are uh, objects that they some indigenous uh, people say, we don't want to hear about them. You stole them. This, this is your story. It's no longer ours. Um, then, you, I mean, you have many positions. I will not go through them. But the point, my point is, like, yes, there is an ethic also of showing, of, uh, of showing object. And that is a, that also part of the question of representation. So all these paintings uh, that are, sh in fact, naturalizing, banalizing oppression, domination, there should be an ethical question of showing them as they have no, it's no problem. But that ethic should be discussed. It's not like it should not come from experts deciding, okay, this is going to be like that, you know. Community should, you know, talk about it. If, for instance, representation of women that demean women, women should be able to, you know, what do we do with that? How do we do that? And we see that more and more uh, controversy today about what is being shown by whom. For whom. And that's a very important, and it's going to be 
uh, a theory of a lot of controversy and, 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 and this object in this museum are, are, going, are going, you know, effectively. Um, uh, how do you talk about the fact that they have been stolen? Because if you just say, oh, th this was stolen, and in fact, in fact, they never say that. They never say that. In the Museum of uh, Broly in Paris, they say, this was brought back by the expedition, the colonial expedition. Oh, okay. Was brought back. Okay. You know, so they, they will never say it had been stolen. So the question of uh, ethic is very important in connected with art history. Art history is not just to say, uh, okay, 1950, that, 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 you know, what that movement is about also. What were the context and ethic today? Sorry, it was a long uh, answer. I think that since this audience is to a large extent also an artistic, uh, comes from an artistic community, so I think it really, uh, it will, it's, it's really very re relevant. Um, thank you. Uh, I think that now we have maybe time for the very last question or comment. Oh. There are two. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I will take the two questions. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Excuse me. So, so Francois just said that she's fine with taking two questions. So please make your comment. Uh, I'll pose your question. Please go ahead. <laughs> well, maybe the, this is this is just me thinking, but. Uh, basically, all of us—we are—we are like all of us are privileged only in the way that we can be here. We can, we can go to the museum. We can, we can, um, we can think of it. We we don't need to think maybe about uh, what what we like to eat today or something like that. So, like for me, this is something that I've been thinking a lot lately. Lately, maybe for a few <laughs> few years that that like. It is very, very difficult for us to, to how to bring uh, the decolonization, and I mean also the decolonization not only of, of uh, the people, but also of the non-human animals to the masses, to, 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 to the people, like how to do it, because like this is what is very, very difficult for us. And I know like it's, it, it, it's just a commentary, it's just something that is, is always in my head and is always maybe. Uh, could you say more about uh, the difficulty? What you call the difficulty? The difficulty, because I'm, for example, I, I also am a linguist, and like for me, a representation is very important, as for example in art. But um, I think when we, for example, speak about art, we speak about culture, we speak about language, we speak about the world we, we use, it's. Um, Maybe for for the people who who struggle, like with with what we will, will we eat tomorrow, what I don't know where will we we will sleep or something like that. Yeah. So this is for me very very yeah. This okay. is the struggle for. It's yeah. I mean it's not a question maybe because it's very difficult, but it's something that that maybe is difficult for me yeah. to have the joy. Joy. I, I don't remember how you called it. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. the, the joy, the joy uh, of being. I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> but okay, that question of being privileged or not being privileged uh, cannot be a source of guilt. Yeah, yeah, no, no, okay. that's not what okay. I meant. No, I meant like how to, like, like. Um, I just, I, I just catch myself uh, a lot thinking about how to do it. How to how to like do it with with these people who maybe don't have the time to think of it okay. or something like. That. Okay, so how do we carve space and 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 um, imagine time for people who do not have the time? I mean, were were fabricated so no, they do not have the time. Then we have to fight so they have the time. Yeah. That's that's the first thing. When I was, you know. Um, we, we thought about that when I was uh, with the, the strike of the cleaning woman in, in France. And uh, they are two hours of transportation, they work and, they, and at night they have to, you know, to go back two hours. They don't have time to think of going to, you know, like even, I'm not talking theater, I'm talking discussion. And, but the strike was that possibility. The strike became that moment of getting out so how do we carve sight of freedom within effectively 
a, a world of unfreedom. And so when you say about that, it's like effectively how would we bring, so if we have time, we have more time than people who have less time because they have to work to bring food on the table. And work means hours, and not only hours, but fatigue, exhaustion. How, so how do we find moment to go over that exhaustion, to nonetheless, and I, I mean, when, when in Berlin, for the Berlin Biennale, I work with refugees, and they are in constant stress. Um, what's gonna happen? It's not so much about sleeping, because they are found, you know, they, they, are, um, they, they are already in Germany for two, three weeks, so they are. But it, the stress of uh, what will happen to me, you know, like uh, in two, three months, a week, the German state gonna tell me, this is over, how I'm gonna, can I get, you know, one more week, two more weeks, and you know, you got children, whatever. It's absolutely, it's like, it does not give you the time to go do something else, you know. So, but you have, uh, wh what we did is like, okay, how are we gonna, um, nonetheless, um, in this stressful, it's, it's this fabrication of stress, uh, tell them that, um, they can have the time, you know, they can have the time. So um, the workshop I did was with refugee, and it was like to let them also on their temporality, and not on the other temporality. So this, term, this, tempora this diversity of temporality has to be also uh, thought and conceptualized. Not everyone has the same time for that. But so even if it's like 10 minutes, it's gonna be 10 minutes, you know, and then you build things. And because we are, as I, again, living in a very hostile environment, the environment is very hostile. Hostile to joy, hostile to, so it has to be really uh, the possibility of carving. Because otherwise, uh, it's as if we give up, in, you know, in front of this uh, possibility. And people, when we, um, it was it was uh, quite um, the, the the cleaning woman who try. Uh, in fact, they finally invent they created a song uh, with a dance, and um, it was called "Frotte uh, Frotte." If you pay, it's like uh, how do you say "Frotte"? Uh, clean, clean, then ba then pay. You know, and there was a rhythm: clean, clean, paying, clean, clean, paying. Let's say you know, like uh, two, two, uh, as well. And it was incredible because they did it, you know, and so that was a, a, a creation in a way. So if we have all, I mean, we, uh, if to answer your question, because it's a question of the we, we have also to uh, um, uh, welcome the different form of creation. And not, you know, uh, you know, like uh, the creation that will be seen. Because <laughs> the, the first time they performed it, it was also with their daughter. And the daughter, of course, uh, we are dressed like this scene on clip, you know, on, on YouTube or whatever. So uh, it was not, you know, contemporary art performance, right? But it was, you know, full of joy and fun, full of joy and fun. So it was this what was important. So I, I would say um, the difficulty of working with different temporality and time, and that is effectively it take, uh, there is sometimes frustration, impossibility, but we have to deal with it. There is no, no, not everyone will have the same uh, uh, time even for us that the time we have to, to even read. Read take times, and we have the time, we have the incredible luxury of having the time to read, or having the time to be here tonight. And uh, I don't know what time is it, but you know. <laughs> it's like all that, that, <laughs> that, that, that is incredible. But we don't, so what do we do with that privilege instead of saying, oh my God, you know, it's, you know how do we work from that? And then uh, carry it in our practice. Uh, what we learn and how do we, how would that transform our practice? That's what we have to think. And you can take the last question. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And like uh, I'm in Slovakia, so recent, like I'm not been here since so many months, but uh, 
when you come to other side of the world, you automatically, organically victim of structural racism. From the airport, EU passport, non-EU passport. So this is like how this word function, but, but really interesting observation for me, it's like a, when I came here in Slovakia, I meet so many people and I heard like so many people coming from the East Slovakia to Bratislava for work. So, so many times we talk about this, you know, refugee and everything, but people are displaced in their own countries right now, in the same EU place. So, as a capitalistic, I know I, I was working as an investment banker for 10 years, so as a capitalistic lens, I understand that. But how, my question is here, like how you see, because colonial, colonialism, it starts within yourself. It's not external, more internal. So how you see like schooling system, this MAC education, this education for all, because my grandmother never like for like exploiting anything. So how you see this anthropocentric and this MAC education in the decolonial uh, process or, or like to see in a wholeness? So that's my question. Yeah, that's very important. I mean, to, but to go to your first remark, I mean, capitalism construct, of course, periphery within its own, you know, and, and this is the, um, the way the entire world is going. Huge metropolis, huge, you know, enclave. Within this metropolis enclave for the wealthy and everyone else around. This you see is in, in the global south everywhere. This is a model that, you know, and how peripheries, people, peasants, or, you know, like small city are totally abandoned because they are no longer part of that economy of service or startup things or blah, blah, blah. So yes, there is, this is what I say, the, the way in which the world was organized until the, the mid 20th century and which was externalized for Europe, for most of Europe, even within, you know, the Soviet Union. Thing. It's gonna. It's coming to Europe now. The way you know that the, the way the SARS was organized as a fetishism. This is coming back uh, to. This is coming back to Europe uh, because uh, you have the globalized wealthy elite, which are no longer, which is no longer national. You know, connected, which is connected to global capital, and uh, but at the same time connected to citizenship because that protect them. You know, they are protected by their state, right? And protected by the law. But they, in their mind, they don't belong to... Uh... So that's one. The second thing, the school, that's very important. It's absolutely important because we know that school... For me, <laughs> when I think about school, you know, and when you see... I mean, the, when the little school, you know, the, day, the kids are, like, yelling, running around, you know, like... Blah, and then the more you go to school, the more you learn to sit like that, quietly, not a word. You don't, you know, because otherwise, you know, if you start to talk with someone, the, the, the teacher say, get out, you know, go to the principal. So you learn to become silent and passive for hours, hours, hours and four years. It's a discipline. It's a disciplining the body and the mind. So that training of disciplining the body and the mind is effectively, you know, teaching you to become this passive person, good person, um, um, accepting authority, you know, as if it's like who are you, you know? Um, when uh, once I, I taught, I was teaching in Berkeley, and it was the first class, and the course was on power. And I entered the class, and, and uh, I sat at the table, you know, the teacher table, and sat, and I did not say things, you know, for one minute. It's long, one minute is long. So I, they look at me. And then I asked them, why do you think I'm the teacher? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? I don't know you. You know me? We don't know each other. And I saw that they started to really freak out after a while because, oh, <laughs> They thought perhaps I was a mad woman from the street, you know. <laughs> and uh, before they were calling the cops of the campus, I said to them, okay, this is about, you know, like the naturalization of power. I enter the room, I sit there for you. It's natural. You are ready to listen to me. Why? Why are you ready to listen to me? 
though you should listen to me. But, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, that how the architecture of the place is, I mean, when you enter a room, there is already an architecture of power, of power of gender, race, and class already. So how that the school room, how do you deconstruct already the room, the space of teaching? So, you know, sometimes now people sit in a circle, you know, to, to not have this. But it goes further, you know, further than that. And this is uh, the, uh, we, you may have noticed for the last five, six years, I would say there was a lot of return to pedagogy. Decolonial pedagogy, queer pedagogy, indigenous pedagogy. How do you teach? How do you co-teach? How do you co-learn? How do you produce knowledge? How do you... And these are very, very important, effectively, to break that uh, mode of, uh, of being passive, listening, you know, accepting hierarchy as, you know, in, in whatever, uh, never, inter never questioning authority. You have the teacher, you know, whatever, you cannot raise your hand and say, no, that's not true. You know, <laughs> you, you know it's impossible. So there is no questioning at all. Uh, there is, no, in fact, you are not encouraged to raise question at school. You are not encouraged because the the class has to go this way and whatever and so on and so forth. And and then also gender is reinforced because all studies show that if boys and girls raise their hand, the teacher will uh, will ask the boy first, you know. And so it's a space that reinforces gender uh, inequality, class inequality. So yes, it's very important to uh, deconstruct that school, really. And then you have uh, the syllabus, you have the curriculum, what is being taught. I mean, okay, as I say, I grew up in Réunion Island, and uh, we were learning about the volcano in France. I mean, all the volcanoes in France are dead, right? There is a volcano in Réunion. Very nicely, it goes, you know, every year, two or twice a year, is an eruption. So instead of taking like a natural class, taking us to the volcano and seeing, well, this is a volcano, da, 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 da. We were learning about the dead volcano in France. This was the kind of things, you know, of effectively, and there is a, an anecdote by Tagore, the Indian writer, uh, which is very interesting also, because he, he, he say he was a little boy and he was at school, and he, was, he had a friend who went on a, on a tree and sat on the branch and started to read. And the uh, headmaster go out, yell at the kid, get him down, you should not be on the tree, uh, you, you know, that's uh, forbidden or whatever. And he said the following class were about tree. So tree has to be dead thing to be talked about and not the living thing that was there in the garden, just there in the schoolyard. So how uh, even some things that were there had to be approach as a dead, as something abstract and dead. And that's part of also of the pedagogy that separates you from also the non-human world or, you know, the plants and all other things, you know, as they are object of study. They are not part of the world. And also uh, how school separates you from your own social world. You know, uh, uh, if you are a black kid or Asian kid or queer or, you know, this, it does not exist. There is some form of universality, which is, in fact, the bourgeois class. So this is effectively, uh, but you have a lot of uh, uh, book about pedagogy because a lot of people understand. You have also so questions by, in, in the university, how you teach. Um, uh, you know, even you have questions about, uh, you know, should exam remain. But um, the university, the school and the university, are such a powerful institution, you know, uh, that is very difficult to, to move them around. But these are very important questions today. Um, and um, uh, in some part of uh, the global south, the state university are falling apart. Uh, so social science and humanities are totally pushed aside. And a lot of private universities are opening and their thing is computer and, and, and commerce. So you are, you are training people for the service industry, you know, and, and uh, so yes, uh, um, but we're thinking the humanity, we're thinking the social science, you know, what is being, um, why don't we teach um, 
what is literature, why do we learn, you know, why don't we read uh, Tagore alongside with, I don't know, uh, etc., etc. What is science, how do we teach science, how, uh, geography, geography is very important. Geography is a way of really uh, showing how to see the world, which is very important. How do you teach history? How do you teach women, uh, feminism? Yeah, it's very important, all this question of curriculum, syllabus, and so on. It's really at the heart, and uh, a lot of students are, but also a lot of teachers, either in high school or even uh, little school and uh, university, are, are asking this question and also being confronted to the privatization of schooling. Yeah, it's very, very important. Very, very important. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure, maybe even joy. <laughs> That's very joyous to, uh, to listen to you. Um, Judith, maybe do you want to say some concluding remarks? Or? No, no. Okay, good. So, thank you. Thank you very much again. I think we can enjoy each other.